All right, good evening, everyone. So my name is Amber Barnes. I will be your moderator for this evening. I'd like to welcome you all to Walk in the Woods, the weird and wonderful world of mushrooms presented by the Woodlands Township Environmental Services Department. We're really excited that you all decided to join us this evening, and we hope you enjoy tonight's presentation. The Environmental Services Department has a lot of programs that we offer throughout the spring and all year long. Upcoming programs and events can all be found online at um, the Woodlands Township tx.gov backslash environment. I'm going to put that website in the chat feature, so be sure to visit our event website for all the details on upcoming events and programs like tonight's. We will be doing additional Walk in the Woods monthly in the month of March and April. In addition to events and programs, this department is a resource for the community on recycling and solid waste services, mosquito surveillance, sustainable gardening, and water conservation. And today we hope to create the best experience for everyone in this presentation. So we do have a few housekeeping rules to go over before we begin. We ask that everyone turn off their mm -hmm. microphone and video during the presentation. I'm watching a weird and wonderful world of mushrooms. There's a bar at the bottom of your screen and um, there is a microphone icon. Make sure that there is a slash going through that microphone icon and that means that you're muted. So we do ask that everyone takes a moment now to check and confirm that they are in fact muted and that your video feature is turned off. If you do have any questions, you can submit those through the chat feature at the bottom of your screen and we'll adjust, address your questions at a break in a point in time in the presentation as well as again at the end of the presentation. So be sure to ask your questions. Now to introduce our guest speaker for the evening, Terry MacArthur. Terry has studied fungi and mushrooms since the late 1970s when she discovered a fascinating thing growing in a part of the woodlands under development. Her interest has continued since. She's been a certified Texas master naturalist since 2001 and presented on the critical role of fungi in the environment to numerous groups in the region during that time. She most recently discussed the topic at the Texas Master Naturalist State Conference in October of 2020. Be prepared to learn to love mushrooms as much as she does as she presents on mushrooms tonight. Terry serves as a water conservation specialist for the Woodlands Township Environmental Services Department. So you may recognize her from a village association meeting or another event. Terry, I will stop sharing my screen and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Amber. And I want to remind everybody, if you have questions as we go along, uh, type them into the chat and uh, at, at breaks and at the end, Amber will help me um, access those questions and we'll talk about them to the extent we have time for. So if you could see all the tens of millions of tons of spores that are released into the atmosphere every year, and they were all in one place, the surface area would be about equal to that of Africa. So there's lots and lots of spores. And yet, only a very small percentage of all fungi even make spore-producing mushrooms. So that means there's a lot of fungi out there. Why would there be so many? And what in the world do fungi do it all day? Let's take a look at what some people think mushrooms are good for. Join me in watching this. My mission is to discover the language of nature, and I believe nature is intelligent. There is a world under the earth full of magic and mystery. It holds the consciousness of nature's connection to all living things. Now these mushrooms, they can heal you, they can feed you, they can kill you. Not like a vegetable, I mean, not like an animal, but somewhere in between. They support life, they convert life. If you're walking through, it's about 200 miles of fungi under every footstep that you take, and that's all over the world. The bulk of the organism is growing underground and is composed of this long thread called a mycelium. Almost everyone knows about the computer internet. The mycelium shares the same network design. It's amazing what we don't know about mushrooms. They really are a frontier of knowledge. You can filter water 
You can create medicinal compounds almost on demand. They have incredible capacity to make things change very quickly. So I am super hopeful. The psychedelic members of the mushroom kingdom are fascinating. I have been a guide for around 350 psilocybin sessions. The most glorious part was that it made me feel more comfortable with living because you're not afraid of that. We need to have a paradigm shift in our consciousness. What will it take to achieve that? We can heal the planet. We can build the future. And our world is fantastic. So there are some of the things that mushrooms do all day, fungi do all day. I'd like for us to deep, dive a little deeper into mushrooms. I There we go, into mushrooms. And so we're going to start out by talking about some of the basics. Um, some of you already know this, especially some of you who've been on mushroom walks with me before, but mushrooms are super important because they decompose matter that's in the soil and on the soil in our forest. Forest systems would completely collapse without fungi because there'd be so much dead wood on the forest floor that nothing new could grow. And, and why would that be? What's in wood that makes it so hard? Wait a minute, I think I hear Ethan calling out the answer. He's saying it's lignin, and he's right. Lignin is what's in wood, and hardly anything can decompose lignin except, yes, fungi. Another way they uh, help with forest health is by forming soil networks. The fungi connect with other fungi, with plants, with trees, and nutrients that the decomposing fungi make available in the soil then get moved around by means of that network within the soil. So there's a lot about fungi, more than just mushrooms, but everyone wants to know about mushrooms. So let's start out with the weird part of the world of mushrooms and take a look at some of them. What do you say? There we go. Uh, last Saturday, a small group joined me down at the Recreation Center at Rob Fleming Park and we looked for mushrooms. This is one that uh, my friend Ethan found. And I want to show it to you in this format uh, to help you understand some of the reasons why it's hard to identify mushrooms when you send me a single photo. Um, it's important to know that where it's growing matters. In this one, you can see that there's some bare soil, there's some leaf litter, and this is growing in a clump, a small clump of mushrooms. Um, this bottom center photo is a, a view of the gill side. And if you can see it, the gills are not all the same length. And an interesting uh, thing about this particular mushroom to note is that the gills start out here at the edge of the cap and run in toward the stem. But in point of fact, if you look, you can see that those gills don't act actually touch the, the stem. And that's important to help us with identification. One of the things we most need to know to help identify mushrooms that we find is the color of the spores. Well, the spores are microscopic, so how are we going to know what color those spores are? And the photo at the top right illustrates one way to find that out. You can see from the photo that uh, they cut the stem off and they put the mushroom cap gill side down on some paper. In fact, they layered some colored paper over some lighter paper so that no matter whether the, gill, the spores from the gills were light or dark when they fell, well, you'd be able to see them. 
And in this case, it may be hard to tell on your screen, I don't know, but the color of the spores on mass as they uh, fell from those gills turned out to be a dark salmon pink color. So this particular mushroom with these features and more, including a view from the top of the cap that doesn't show here, helps us know that uh, this particular mushroom is an antheloma. It's probably Stricteus. And it's um, one of many interesting and weird fungi in our local area. This is Ammonita muscaria. Um, Amber will be putting the names of some of the mushrooms into the chat box in case you want to know how to spell them as we go along. This one is a psychoactive mushroom. A lot of people think that it is poisonous and it can be if you consume too much. Uh, it's a great decomposer in our forests, but it also forms those fungal networks that we heard about in that video clip. In Texas, we find Ammonita most often associated with oaks and some of our nut trees like hickories, um, as well as pine trees. This is kind of a common mushroom in our area. If the weather is warm and a little moist, um, we could see these anytime from spring through fall. This beautiful mushroom is in the bracket fungi family. Instead of gills on the bottom, as we saw in that very first one we looked at, this one has tiny tube-like openings on the bottom and they're called pores. And inside those tubes are where the spores stay until they are ripe and dry and ready to disperse. Um, wind carries them, water carries them, even animals carry them. This one is probably Trimedes versicolor. Uh, it's another wonderful decomposing mushroom in our local forest. And we find it as pictured here on down wood in our mixed hardwood forest. This is kind of an interesting looking one. And as Amber told you, I saw a something growing as the woodlands was being developed. And this is what I saw. It is the columned stinkhorn. And yes, it really smells bad. It is Clathrus columnata. Its scheme for um, moving its spores around is this sticky and stinky mass that it creates inside that holds the spores. Flies are attracted to it because they think that smell is from rotting flesh and that's kind of what it smells like. They come and land thinking they're going to get a meal and they get this, this mass on their feet, on their bodies. They fly away and the next place they land, they leave the spores there. So it's another terrific decomposer in our forest and if you keep your eyes open for it, you might see it. This one was photographed just uh, about a week ago. Oh, this guy is interesting to know. Let me see how I erase. No. Okay, I'm not sure how to get rid of those. Sorry. Um, this one is fun to know because of its color and a couple of its interesting features. It's that bright orange pumpkin looking uh, color. It grows in clumps as you see in this slide. If you find it, don't eat it because it's toxic. But you could collect a couple of specimens, preferably in a paper bag or a wax paper bag. Never collect mushrooms in plastic. It causes them to start breaking down very quickly. But um, take them home, take a couple of them home, go into a dark closet and close the door, wait a few minutes for your eyes to adjust to the dark. And then when you open your paper bag with these inside, if they are in fact the correct mushroom, they'll be glowing green. The name of this mushroom, its real name is Omphalotus eredens but its common name is jack-o'-lantern. 
and you can see why. This one is um, in the family of local fungi that we see a lot uh, called Ganoderma. It's another polypore like the turkey tail, the Tremetes we saw earlier. It has pores on the bottom rather than gills. This is a very long lived mushroom. It can grow for decades at the base of a tree and get quite huge. And what's interesting about it is that in Asia, it's considered uh, highly prized for its medicinal value. It has properties that are antibiotic, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, antifungal. It has some regenerative benefits. It's too hard and woody to eat. So it's often ground into a powder form and then uh, steeped in the form of a tea to drink. Here in the West, we have finally begun to put some value on this mushroom, which um, in Japan, it's called Rishi. And that's how you will most often see it labeled on supplements that you can now find in health food stores and vitamin shops. So um, it has great medicinal value and health benefits. And here's the last one to show right now. It's Lactarius indigo. And yes, it really is that blue when it's fresh and young. It's um, a really great edible, one of my favorites. And when you cook it, the cap, the gills, the stem all stay that blue color. How many blue foods do we get to eat? So it's a lot of fun. And this one is another of the important networking fungi that form in the soil and connect to other fungi, connect to trees and plants and help move nutrients around. And so this next slide I'm gonna show you was, oops, sorry, was actually a leaf that's partially decomposed that we found last Saturday out in our mushroom walk. Uh, one of the guys picked it up, uh, it ha was in direct contact with the soil. so. Um, one of the soil fungi had already started growing its hyphae onto this leaf to decompose it. And it's a great way for you to have a visual hint of how those soil networks might look if you could see them. So I loved this photo. I, you know, I was so thrilled that we found this while we were out there. So We're kind of done with the weird part of fungi now. Uh, we've seen these strange looking things that we can find right in our own local forest. So before we move on to the wonderful part, are there any questions, Amber? We do have a few questions, Terry. Okay. The first question someone asked, um, why does the jack-o'-lantern mushroom glow? Uh, as with other organisms on Earth, it's uh, bioluminescent. And so it collects up light during the day and in the dark, it gives off this glow. Not everything that bioluminesces is green, but this one is. It's an it's a amazing green glow. Wonderful. And then a similar question, what gives mushrooms their unique colors? Uh, well, what gives people and animals unique colors? We're all different and mushrooms are all different. It depends some, in some cases on the uh, makeup of the soil uh, and other uh, minerals and such, but it is a species um, preference in most cases. All right, Terry, we do have another question. Um, are the mushrooms that you showed rare and are there endangered mushrooms? There probably are some endangered mushrooms. I don't know which they would be in Texas. Uh, none of the mushrooms I showed you are rare. Uh, depends on the time of year and some conditions like how much moisture and what the soil temperature is, not the air temperature, but what the soil temperature is, whether these mushrooms will appear, but all of them are common in our local woods. And mushrooms, by the way, 
are simply the fruiting body of the mushroom, uh, the fungal body itself, the mushroom entire, I mean the fungus entire. So when you pick mushrooms, it's like picking an apple from a tree. You're not destroying the fungus itself. Amber, tell me how to get rid of those marks I left on the screen. Uh, Terry, I think it's a, a feature of your PowerPoint presentation, correct? Uh, no, it's my annotate. And I don't know how to get rid of it. We might have to just let it stay there and move on. I will see what I can find and, and get back to you, Terry. Uh, do you have time for another question? I think we have time for one more. And if there are any left after that, we'll, we'll try to address them at the end. Wonderful. So the final question before we go back to the presentation is how many species of mushrooms are there? Oh, um, probably millions. We only really know about uh, a few thousand of them but they are, um, most of these mushrooms I showed you uh, that are in our local forests are in other countries, other ecosystems, other places in the globe. Uh, they're quite common worldwide. Wonderful, Terry. So we did have, um, just to let you know, we had some technical support from our chat room. Um, I, it looks like we can go in and just, I can clear all your drawings, Terry. Thank you. And thank you to Mike. <laughs> so uh, which ones are poisonous? A number of them are poisonous. There are quite a few. Um, a lot of them are in the Ammonita family, but there are other poisonous mushrooms as well. I'm going to just make a distinction between poisonous and toxic here. There are some that kill you. Uh, especially some of those in the Ammonita family. If you eat them, uh, they destroy your liver, period. There are quite a number though that are toxic. Um, they don't necessarily kill you, but you may end up wishing you were dead after a few days of diarrhea and vomiting. And then of course, there's always the problem of food allergies. I mean, some people can't eat strawberries, some people can't eat tomatoes. So the same could be true with fungi. So if you are with someone who really knows mushrooms and they say this is a good edible and you take some home to cook, the best advice is always to only cook a small amount and taste a small amount and save some of the fresh fungi to take to the emergency room with you because you may need them if you uh, have a sensitivity to what's in those mushrooms. All right, Terry, we'll let you get back to your PowerPoint presentation. Just as a reminder, any questions can go into the chat feature. If we didn't get to your questions, we will have a Q&A time at the end of the presentation tonight. So why dwell on fungi? Well, they're pretty darn important. Uh, we've already started talking about the fact that they uh, form, the, form these soil networks that help move nutrients around, that help decompose. Um, and ecosystems is where we get goods and services. I know you can think of some goods from ecosystems, things like food products, nuts and other edibles. But tonight we're going to talk more about the services we get from ecosystems and fungi are such an important part of that because they help ecosystems really stay healthy and do a lot of great work. Um, I want to talk to you for just a minute about a particular family of fungi that I think are really interesting. They're called glomeromycota. I think Amber's going to put that word in the chat box so you'll know how to spell it. But um, they are the most ancient of the terrestrial fungi. We find them in the fossil records going back 450 million years or, or more. And they are interesting in so many different ways. They are some that form those soil networks, but they not only grow their um, fungal body, which in its entirety is called the mycelium, 
grow it around the roots of say trees, but as they expand their growth, uh, those thread-like growths that we saw in that earlier video are called hyphae, and they're how the mushroom entire, the mycelium expands its size. They grow their hyphae directly into the roots of trees and connect at a cellular level with the roots of those trees. They, within those root cells, they form structures called arbuscules, and it's inside that structure that that exchange of nutrients happens. Let's think about how that works. The trees spend all day, as long as the sun is out, photosynthesizing. They're making some of their own food. They convert, uh, you know, elements from the atmosphere and some sunlight. They make sugars and starches to help feed themselves. Well, guess what's the favorite food of fungi? Yes, starches and sugars. So the mycelium grows right around the root system. And as the decomposing fungi release nutrients in the soil, these networking fungi move it to uh, trees and plants that need them. And the glomeromycota that grow into the cells in the roots of these trees really make that exchange happen quickly. So they make trees really healthy. Uh, another thing about these fungi, these and they're microscopic fungi, by the way, is that they actually engineer soil to make it uh, healthier for trees and plants to grow. The hyphae as they grow out are covered with a sticky substance called glomalin. And the term is that they cause soil particles, bits of soil particles to glom together. And that leaves openings where those particles were loose and apart before. Now they're all together. It leaves opening, it leaves spaces so that within that soil where these fungi exist, things like oxygen and water can move much more freely and be much more accessible to the vegetation that needs it. And you know, I don't think there's anybody you talk to these days who isn't concerned with excess carbon in the atmosphere. Well, here's one more interesting thing about the glomeromycota family of fungi. They all form symbiotic relationships with vegetation. And because that intimate symbiotic relationship is at the cellular level, they have the ability to pull up to 70% of the carbon that the tree brings in from the atmosphere directly into the fungal body. And once it's there, it's in the soil, it's trapped in the soil more or less permanently. Because even though trees are great as carbon sinks, they're not really carbon vaults. Um, they can release carbon back into the atmosphere or into the soil where it migrates back to the atmosphere. But these fungal bodies uh, store it in the soil within their bodies. And even if that fungus dies, they're very resistant to decomposition. So it is a very nearly perfect way to bank carbon in the soil. So these guys are really something to learn more about. I, I think that... Um, we're going to see a lot more study of these families of fungi because our technology is improving every day. We, we have the opportunity to learn more and more about the great things they do for us. Let's go back to our slides again. So here are some things to know. We've talked about most of these already. I usually ask the audience at this point, what do you know about fungi? Uh, some of the answers I typically get are that they're good to eat, and they are, or they can kill you, and they can. You know, one of the things I wonder about, though, is as we mentioned earlier and is uh, repeated here on this slide, fungi are in the fossil records from hundreds of millions of years ago way before humans came on the scene. So why would they be able to kill us? They didn't have those adaptations to
to to warn us away. So that's something to think about. Some people comment that there are parasitic fungi, and there are. There are fungi that if they end up in a relationship with one of your trees or plants can make it less healthy or even kill it. But the beauty of fungi that uh, we've already been talking about, remember I said they were also antifungal. These mushrooms that form these networks can even prevent the bad guys from getting a toehold on your tree or plant. So there are good guys and there are bad guys as in all kinds of organisms. And then I never fail to hear that there are magic mushrooms. Well, as you saw in that earlier video clip, there is quite a lot of work being done with psychoactive mushrooms. They're finding that it's very helpful with PTSD patients, with folks with end of life anxiety, uh, especially terminal cancer patients, some other forms of depression and anxiety. So I think, again, as our technology improves, we're going to see more and more about using micro doses of psychoactive um, mushroom components to help treat those things. Mushrooms are very, and fungi are very adaptable as they grow their hyphae through the soil to network. Those hyphae are where all the hard work is done. Uh, they are what comes in contact with things in the soil, minerals, um, dead insects, uh, decomposing leaves, and they have this entire sweep of enzymes at their disposal that they mix and match depending on what it is they come in contact with. They call up the enzymes, they effectively break down whatever it is, decompose it, in effect they liquefy it, absorb it into the, the hyphae, and then they can shuttle it off through the network to a tree or a plant that needs those nutrients that they just acquired. And yes, they can be predatory. There are some families of fungi that use attractants of some sort, pheromones, hormones, some kind of chemical that they release into the soil. And it especially is to attract um, soil insects and other invertebrates in the soil, nematodes and such, that it calls out to them and says, hey, lunch is over here, come and take a bite. So those, those soil organisms go and start to munch their lunch on this fungus. Well, the chemicals that are in it kill those insects, for example. The hyphae break it down, use their enzymes, absorb in the nutrients they want, go to the nearest tree partner they have, and the fungus says, hey, tree, I've got some nitrogen. You want it? The tree says, yeah, man, and here, I've got some excess carbs and sugars. You want it? and they exchange nutrients. So yes, there can be predatory fungi. Um, these, these predatory fungi especially, and all of those that are insect pathogenic are called metorhizium fungi. So I've asked Amber to include that word too in case you wanna do any additional research on it. Let's talk a little bit about this word that uh, we haven't really uh, uh, talked about yet. We've talked about networking fungi, but they are called mycorrhizal. Now they're, they're the ones who form the networks. And there are seven main groups of mycorrhizal fungi, but I, I wanna mention some of the interesting facts about just two of them. Uh, the first are called endomycorrhizal, those are the ones like the um, glomeromycota I mentioned that grow within the vegetation and connect, connect with it at a cellular level. As you can imagine, because that transference of uh, nutrients happens at such a rapid pace that uh, decomposition is also speeded up to supply those nutrients. So in forests where the dominant trees associate more with endomycorrhizal fungi, what you find is thinner layers of leaf litter, thinner soils, uh, lower pH levels, but really high diversity of vegetation. 
because these guys are really party animals. I mean, they, you know, as long as you have some sugar and starches to share, they are willing to bring you into the network and share the, the nutrients they're pulling from the soil with you. What that means is on the downside, they're willing to let non-natives come into the forest with them in even those things that are invasive. So invasive species can be a bit more of a problem in those kinds of forests. The dominant trees in endomycorrhizal um, forests are maples and elms and ash trees. And uh, the most commonly seen invasives would be things like uh, Asian climbing roses or Japanese honeysuckle or garlic mustard. The other kind of um, mycorrhizal fungi I want to mention here for a minute are the ectomycorrhizal. Now those are like the Ammonitis and the Lactarius that I told you earlier when we were looking at the weird fungi uh, are also networking um, in the soil. They grow their mycelium around the root system, but they don't actually penetrate into the cellular level. So the exchanges while they're facilitating uh, more nutrients of availability to the trees, it's a much slower process. And so in those forests, uh, you see he heavier layers of leaf litter, you see thicker uh, soils, higher pH, and a much lower diversity of trees and plants. These guys are more specialists where the endomycorrhizal fungi are more generalist. These guys don't like strangers to show up and try to join their, their party. So if you're not an offspring of one of the trees that's already in those forests, or at least the same species as are in those forests, then you're gonna have a much harder time getting a toehold. And that means it reduces not just non-native species from joining in, not just invasives from joining in, but it's even harder for other native trees that aren't already present to get a, a toehold there. Those uh, dominant trees in these kind of forests are oaks, um, trees in the pecan family, um, walnuts, hickories, and pecans, as well as pine trees. So the Difference is in how the interactions between the fungi and the vegetation goes. I, I don't know. I, I'm fascinated by everything we're learning as our technology improves. So I, I encourage you, if you want to know more, to um, consider doing some study. I'm going to recommend a couple of books toward the end. But for now, let's figure out what fungi are. Are they plants? Well, carbon is the basis for life on earth and especially for trees and plants. It's how trees communicate with each other. But the only way that happens is for those fungal networks to form and have that carbon within those fungal bodies so that the trees can initiate that conversation, that communication with others of their species. There's some work that indicates, I noticed Suzanne Simard was in that earlier video clip. Um, she's done a lot of research and talks a lot about how there are mother trees in some forests who can even recognize their offspring, their own offspring, and through those fungal networks can shuttle nutrients directly to those plants when they need it. It's amazing stuff. It's really wonderful stuff. A couple of things about of plants to notice here. They store their energy in starch. Uh, their cell walls have cellulose. But what about animals? Are fungi animals? About 30% of our DNA contains elements that are in the DNA of fungi. Animals, including humans, are much more closely related to fungi than fungi are to plants. So a couple of things here about animals. They store their energy in glycogen and their membranes contain cholesterol. 
So what's unique about fungi? They don't have chlorophyll. So to get the food they need, those starches, those sugars, they absolutely have to have those networking capabilities to interact with trees and other green vegetation to get to that uh, product that those plants are making all day. Uh, if you'll notice, fungi also store their energy in glycogen molecules as animals do. And while their cell walls contain cellulose like plants, they also contain chitin. And what do we know about chitin? I know some of you who have been on nature walks with me before have heard this conversation. Linda, was that you that said chitin is what makes up the exoskeletons of insects? Yes, that's right. So that's a pretty hard material. And what that means for those of us who love to eat fungi, we love to eat mushrooms, if we eat them raw, all the nutritional value passes right through our gut because we do not have the enzymes to break down that chitin. So if you want to eat mushrooms and get all the nutrition available, cook them first. The heat breaks down the chitin and makes all those nutrients available. And one last thing here, the membranes of fungi contain ergosterol. That's a steroid alcohol that converts to vitamin D when you expose it to sunlight. If you really want to get full bang for your buck when you're eating mushrooms, set them out in the sun for a couple of hours to a day. You can boost that vitamin D level quadruple the amount of vitamin D. And when you cook those mushrooms later to eat, it doesn't affect the level of vitamin D that are in it. So they're pretty darn interesting and valuable to us and to the rest of the world to make ecosystems function well. But here's the problem. We don't put a dollar value on the work that fungi do. We don't even put dollar value on the services we get from the ecosystems where fungi are helping them function and have those interactions. Maybe it's time knowing more and learning more every day from new technology. Maybe it's time for us to not be so complacent about the negative impacts we're having on ecosystems and especially on fungi and try to make some behavior changes that might help conserve the work they do. And, and how can we do that? Well, right in our own residential landscapes. We have options. For one thing, how about stop using chemicals on your grass, on your yard, on your landscape, on your plants? A couple of bad things happen when you use those chemicals. Number one, you create a hostile environment for pollinators and other beneficial insects. And yes, you really do want insects in your landscape. Another thing that happens is it makes your plants and your grass lazy. If you're putting the nutrients right there on top of the soil, what incentive do they have to grow their roots deep down and to find the nutrients that are available in the soil? So with shallow rooted plants, shallow rooted grass, they're far less healthy come springtime. You know, you immediately have to start using other chemicals to fight off insects and diseases in your lawn. So instead of that, perhaps get a soil test done, find out whether you really need to add nutrients, but consider using some of the biological inoculants that are available out there, especially those that contain mycorrhizal fungi. Sprinkle a little bit of those granules in your, in your landscape, water it in, the fungi begin to grow, those networks begin to form, your plants and grass grow their roots deeper, Everybody gets healthier, and it's a good thing. E.O. Wilson said the 21st century is destined to be known as the century of the environment. You know, we're 20 years in, and I'm not seeing a whole lot of environmental improvement uh, globally. So maybe it's time for us to make some of these behavior changes, find some ways that we can help our fungal partners in ecosystems get healthier and uh, service better than they already do. 
I mean, if we're not willing to take some steps now, instead of E.O. Wilson's words, we may end up in the words of those other sages, the rock group called Seether. In one of their songs, they say, I am prepared now that everything's gonna be fine. One day too late. And that is not where we wanna end up. So for those of you who've asked about books I use, our local Bible is the Field Guide to Texas Mushrooms. It's a couple of decades old. It's by Susan and Van Metzler. Um, it's really our local common mushrooms. Uh, how do I deal information about them? There is a newer book. It came out last year. It's called Mushrooms of the Gulf Coast. Alan and Arlene Bissett uh, collaborated with our our local big thicket mushroom expert, David Lewis, to put out this book. It is a terrific book. Fair warning, the, the fungi in it, the mushrooms in it are listed in alphabetical order by scientific name. Well, I don't know all the scientific names of mushrooms. So I usually start with the Metzler's book because Mushrooms are grouped in families in that book, and I find the one that I need to know more about. Then I go to the new book because it has, it does have some updated material and some additional things about the mushrooms that are helpful to know. Another book that I use frequently is David Aurora's Mushrooms Demystified. It's a large book. It's a lot of conversation about what mushrooms do all day. So it's more than just an ID guide. Um, note for this book is that uh, he's based on the West Coast. So there are quite a lot of mushrooms in the book that we will not see here. But if you want to learn about mushrooms, it's, it's, it's great. And then that video clip we saw earlier is from a movie called Fantastic Fungi. It's available on YouTube to buy or to rent. It's not free. But this is its companion book called also Fantastic Fungi. It has the most amazing photo photographs by um, Louis Schwartzberg. If you're not familiar with him, if you have uh, Netflix and you go on there and do a search for moving art, he has some little short videos of 25, 30 minutes, but it's the most marvelous nature photography you'll ever see virtually no spoken words, a little bit of background music, but uh, in the evening, it's terrific to relax for 25, 30 minutes watching one of Schwartzberg's moving art videos. Um, he has the photographs in this book. The book is a compilation of essays by quite a prominent group of mushroom writers. So um, I might suggest you would look for it. I think we're done, Amber. I'm ready to take some more questions. But while we do that, I'm putting up this slide that has my contact information. So if you need to leave and you have a question in the chat box, or maybe you didn't put your question in the chat box, I'd welcome your inquiry by email. Um, if you want to send photos, I'll do my best to try to help you with ID. If you just want to reach out and make comments, uh, this is my information and I welcome your, your contact. So Amber, do we have more questions? We sure do, Terry. Um, you just uh, first addressed the um, opportunity for people to email you photos. Um, I'm curious, before we dive into the questions, would you recommend the um, iNaturalist app to help with mushroom identification? I definitely would. Um, I don't think as many people use iNaturalist for mushroom ID as could or should. It's, you know, it's a terrific application. There are some others as well uh, that I've seen. Uh, so, you know, if, you, if you're if you not crazy about iNaturalist, go to one of the app stores and look for some of the other, um, um, some of them have the second word in the name is snap, like tree snap and flower snap and things like that. Others are uh, photo picture something, I don't remember. But anyway, there's lots of apps, but iNaturalist is a terrific one to use. Agreed. All right, Terry. Well, that was a wonderful presentation. I think everyone learned quite a bit and are probably excited to go out wandering along the pathways or even in their own yard 
but we do have a few questions. So I will dive into those with you. The first question that we have, um, someone was asking if you have any suggestions for engaging in local fungi discovery. Um, so there used to be a Houston based mushroom club, but it, it fell apart a few years back, um, you know, aging members. Um, David Lewis is over in the Big Thicket area, and there is a, a mushroom organization there that uh, goes out and looks for mushrooms. But if you're interested in something a little more casual, if you'll send me an email and tell me your your interest uh, from time to time, um, as I as we did last Saturday, a small group of us go out together to hunt for mushrooms, see what we can find. Um, on dry days when we can't find mushrooms, it turns into more of a nature walk. But uh, last Saturday, we found quite a few interesting mushrooms. Uh, it, uh, most of them were in the polypore family, but that antiloma I showed you, that I showed you the spore print, um, that was one that we found last Saturday. Wonderful. And Terry, we do have one more question in our chat. Um, in regard to the, um, the chitin and the cellulose, do mushrooms have these in their structures, just like in the walls of plants? So yeah, it's the, it's the, um, it's the cell coverings. Um, cellulose is what's in the cell walls in uh, plants. And it's also in mushrooms, but mushrooms have the chitin as part of their cell walls. And that's what, and of course, that's where all the nutrients are stored. And that's why it's so important to cook the mushrooms is because otherwise that chitin does not break down in our guts when we eat mushrooms. Terry, I think that wraps up our questions for the evening. We are getting a lot of positive responses in the chat. A lot of our participants are saying thank you. Um, even some comments stating that they will never look at mushrooms the same again and they can't wait to go out and do some discovery of their own. So I think um, you really uh, brought attention to something that a lot of people were interested in and gave us a wonderful presentation this evening. Well, if you'll send me a note, if you're interested, uh, next time we schedule a mushroom walk, I'll reach out to, to you. Thank you for joining me tonight. I enjoyed it. I wish we could have been in person, but maybe I'll see you out there on the nature trail. Good night, everybody. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening.